This morning, we're going to go through one of my all-time favorite stories in Scripture. It, it has a little bit of destruction and, <laughs> um, and a lot of rebuilding, which is what God is the pro at. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to Mark chapter 2, but we're not going to get into it right away. But um, if you would like to be there so that when we're ready, we can get going. It's Mark chapter 2, and it's the beginning of that story, and I'm sure that you've heard the story before. It's one that's familiar. We're just going to look at it again, hopefully with some new eyes. Uh, it, this may surprise you, but back in school, I used to uh, occasionally participate in uh, the drama club. I know. I knew you'd be surprised. I knew you'd be surprised. So um, I was in some, some plays um, and that sort of thing until I realized that really I'd rather build the sets, and that was much more fun. So um, I got to do that later in my dramatic career. But uh, in one skit, I was supposed to be lame, right? Which meant I had a limp, because in the elementary school, that's what you do. You limp when you're lame, right? Because um, you can't have children carrying each other around. Uh, it gets dangerous. So uh, I had to limp, and I kept forgetting which leg was injured. <laughs> So the limp would be on this side, and after a while, right, it would switch to this side. And you could, and then sometimes it was like it was high up in my leg, and sometimes it was low down, and sometimes it was my back, right? So it, it was the traveling ailment. And uh, it was a problem. So my teacher came up with a really fabulous solution. 
and she gave me a rock. It wasn't huge. It was about that big, right? A little rock. And she says, stick it in your shoe. <laughs> right? So then when you take a step, oh, hello. <laughs> right? The rock lets you know, I am here. You don't want to step here, right? It's like having a Lego on your foot, right? So you're walking. Oh, yep, that's the one. And you remember, like, that's the leg that's injured for the play, right? It was very, very, very helpful to remember that that was the leg that was injured. And your limp was consistent. Ladies, I think every single one of us, and um, Ted and Lance, sorry. I had to add Lance in. We have been ignoring you and neglecting you all weekend. Uh, uh, I think we're all walking around with pebbles in our proverbial shoes, right? We all have a limp. We all have a limp. And um, it's time that we extend grace to ourselves and to one another. So we're going to look at a story of grace this morning. So if you're in Mark chapter 2, we're going to look through this beautiful, wonderful, amazing story. <clears throat> Now, some of you will have read John Ortberg's, I keep crying, so the tissue's staying. Um, John Ortberg's wonderful words on this story, and he calls the four men who appear in this story uh, the fellowship of the mat. I love it. It's a nod to Tolkien's writing, of course, and the fellowship of the ring, and the four who gather for a task that could not be done without each other. All right, so the fellowship of the mat. And we're just going to read here a few of these verses. And again, he entered Capernaum. So Jesus entered Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that he was in the house. You ever heard that Jesus was in a house? Yeah. So it was heard that Jesus was in a house. And immediately many gathered together. Because when Jesus shows up, people come. Because Jesus carries power. Jesus carries healing. Jesus carries wonder and amazement. And where Jesus is, people want to be. Um, makes you wonder, are people coming to your house? Right? Are they coming to where Jesus is? Maybe your house is your church house. Are they coming there? Do they meet Jesus there on Sabbath morning? How about Wednesday night? How about Pathfinders? How about youth group? Right? Are they meeting Jesus there? Because if Jesus is being lifted up, Right? If I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Right? So is Jesus being exalted? If you want, you want your family to grow, you want your house to grow, you want your church to grow, lift up Jesus. So he's in the house and many are gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. So uh, I like having people over. I uh, believe in crowd management. Right? I don't, I don't invite, in so, invite so many people over that they are running out the front doors and hanging out the windows. And Jesus, it says, and he preached the word to them. Ironic, since he is the word. right? But he's preaching the good news about the kingdom. The kingdom come, the kingdom now, the kingdom to come, the kingdom alive and well. He's preaching to them the word. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Paralytic. We might walk around with a limp, right? We've had some terrible things happen, and it's wounded our souls. Maybe it's injured our bodies. But this guy, so if you, you look back at the Greek, which... My Greek tutor would be so proud right now. We're going we're gonna to actually look at a Greek, wo Greek word. So the, the Greek is paralutiko, right? And it means literally that his body was melting away. Okay, so it means that there was just the musculature, that there was just nothing left. So he was just a melting away man. So literally, his body was becoming nothing. It was dying. So when we say the paralyzed man, sometimes we think, you know, it's, it's like uh, my cousin, when he was 16 years old, he dove into a river, hit a rock, broke his neck, and that was the end of his moving his arms and legs, right? He's paralyzed. So that's sometimes what we think, but this isn't what the, the word means. It doesn't mean that parts of him were paralyzed, right? It means that he was melting away. The man that had been is no longer, 
and his body is just becoming misshapen, malformed, and not just parts of it, all of it, right? He is no longer a man. He is melting away. So he is carried by four men. And when they could not come near to Jesus because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. I have friends who um, leave dishes in the sink. Napkins I find under couches, right, after a good party. Game night at my house, you find maybe a root beer float cup left behind or some popcorn hidden in places that you're like, how did that get there? Right? I have never once had a friend take the roof off my house. <laughs> never had it happen. Now, here's a true story. Hold on. When I, we were uh, like 14 and 15 years old, my parents used to let us light off fireworks at our friend's house in the driveway. They had a huge yard, right? You're never going to cause any trouble there. <laughs> we uh, may or may not have set their roof on fire with a Roman candle. So that was fun, right? But I've never had friends who've taken the roof off my house. Never. And yet the roof disappears, and this man comes down to be near Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. When Jesus saw their faith, the only one who's sitting in front of him is the one who was on the mat, right? He's been lowered down through the roof onto the floor in front of him. And so Jesus would have had to look up to see these guys. And it's the evidence of their faith that they have carried someone who cannot carry himself to Jesus. And he says, your faith, your faith has done this thing. Look, man, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes who are sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? True story? God forgives sins, right? So they're asking a, an interesting question here. Who can forgive sin but God? God, God can forgive sin. They don't get that Jesus is God. All right? The reason he has the ability to heal is not because he's a magician. It's because he is God. It's because he has the power of the Almighty in him. But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. The fellowship of the mat. The four men who knew one who could no longer do anything for himself. The four men who heard the stories of the blind seeing, of the starving being fed, of living water and the bread of life. And they said, there is something we can do about our friend. And can you imagine... That all of a sudden, you who have been laying on a mat, your friends come bursting into your house and start picking up your bed and carrying you across town, right? There's not much you can do to stop them. <laughs> They're determined. They're determined to see you well. So they take you to the one that they have heard of, that they are learning of, and that they are going to make sure you meet. And they pick him up. They carry him across town. And they can't get in the house. But they are not leaving without seeing Jesus. So they take apart a roof. And they lower him through the roof to make sure he has met Jesus. They don't leave, right? They sit there peering through the hole in the roof, looking down to see what is Jesus going to do for our friend. We have brought him this far. Because even touching someone who was so deformed would have been considered a curse 
right? To be associated with such a person would have made them unclean. It meant that they were risking not being able to be a part of the community, right? They couldn't go to church. They touched an unclean person. They couldn't be a part of the regular traditions of their own community because the man that they were carrying was foul. So they were willing to do anything to risk their own reputation, to risk their own community connections, to risk their own relationships, to carry this man to Jesus. And they did that through town, carting a melting body through the streets to a house where the one man who could change all of this was. And they arrived there at that house knowing that Jesus has the power to do this, and they will not leave. They will not go away. They do not leave until they make sure their friend has seen Jesus. And Jesus knows that it is the friends of the paralyzed man who have made this encounter possible. And he says it is their faith, their belief that Jesus can make this right that enables them to carry their friend to him. Right? He said it is their faith that says to the man who is melting away, your sins are forgiven. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't just give him the instant cure? Right? He could have done that. Get up. Go. You're well. Right? But instead, he provokes the crowd around him by saying, your sins have been forgiven. Evidence, absolutely, that Jesus is God and has the ability to do so, right? He claims that right there. Blasphemy, if you don't believe Jesus is God, okay? So he he claims that. He angers the crowd right there. But he does the thing that the man needs most. He acknowledges that the situation the man is, is is in is a result of sin, Right? That what has happened to his body, what has happened to his life, what has happened to his mind, what has happened to his relationships and his community connections, that that is a result of sin. That that melting away of a life is because of sin, that disconnection with God. He says, your sin, your disconnection is healed. Your sins are forgiven. You are restored. You are at one with God, right? That's what he gives him. And then, because that's not enough for the crowd, isn't it interesting? It's not the man who starts complaining. The man is happy. He's been forgiven. But that's not enough for the crowd. So the crowd starts to think these things in their mind, and Jesus, the mind reader, says to them, what do you want? You want me to forgive him, or you want him to get up and walk? Because oftentimes we want to see the result of the forgiveness, but not watch the process of the forgiveness. Right? We don't, don't want to deal with the messy stuff of sin. We don't want to deal with that. But we want to see the, the results of God's healing. Right? And that can come by all sorts of magic and, mis- magic and mystical ways. Except it can't. Because the reality is, is when sin breaks us, only God can heal us. So... He says, okay, you've been forgiven, but just to add a leather log to the fire, get up. Get all the things you came in on and get out. Right? Now, I've never seen anything like that. I have never seen anything like that. I've never had anybody come carried in on a mat to church or to prayer meeting. I've never seen that. And yet Jesus says, that we as a community of faith, when we bring people who are broken to Jesus, he heals them. He heals them. Are we limping? Yeah. Some of us are limping and we need some healing, right? All of us are limping in different areas and different arenas. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. Who is it that carries you? Who's your fellowship? The people that surround you That when you get yourself into a situation that you cannot carry yourself to Jesus, you don't have the emotional stamina, you don't have the spiritual availability, you don't have the physical capacity to carry yourself to Jesus, who is it that carries you? Who is it that carries you? Who are the friends, the people who surround you? 
that will carry you to Jesus? Who are the people that you can get on the phone with and say, I can't do this right now, and I, I need you to surround me. I need you to pray me through this. I need you to carry me. Woo! There's some results. No, it's good. I like it. I like it. It's good. Siri. Siri is carrying us, right? It's good. It's very good. I like it. It's good. Right? But who is it? Because, ladies, we don't do the journey with Jesus alone. Yes, Jesus is there. Absolutely. He's the prime person who carries us, who gives us strength and perseverance and all of that. But he says, I'm also going to give you a community of people who will surround you. For this man, it was four other men. Who is your community? Who is your fellowship? Who is safe for you to run to? These people knew what his problem was, right? They weren't ignorant to the fact that he was paralyzed and that was a result of his own choices, okay? They were not stupid to the facts of his life. They knew what his life was like. So who are the people that you trust who will carry you? They carried. Yeah, they do. And they carried him, right? They care for you. Who are those people who have the faith to say, I know where Jesus is and I will take you there? Right? Do you have them in your life? Some of us do. Some of us have been able to build those friendships and relationships through the years. Some of us don't right now. But I think this is an opportunity to say, I need to build a community that knows that I got a rock in my shoe and I'm going to stumble and I'm going to fall and I'm going to need help. And when I stumble and when I fall, I need someone to carry me. I need someone to pick me up and take me to Jesus. Right? Who, who is carrying you? We as women, often we carry too many things, don't we? It's okay for us to carry each other. And somehow, it's a miracle of God, somehow when we carry each other, the burden is lighter. Right? It makes it possible for us all to approach Jesus. Because it wasn't just the paralyzed man who was rewarded that day, was it? Because the friends who believed that Jesus could make the difference got to see their friend made well Amen. and what a blessing that is so who who is carrying you who yes question family true friends good good i'm glad you have those that's wonderful yeah so second question who are you carrying and i'm not talking about who are you doing a lot of really good stuff for, right? These friends are not doing really good stuff for this man. They may be. They might be bringing him food. They may be helping support his family because he's not able to work. He's not able to do anything, right? But I'm not talking about just helping to take care of someone. I'm asking, who are you carrying to Jesus, right? Who is it that you are willing to drop anything when you hear Jesus is in town? And you are willing to fight through the crowds, and you are willing to make sure that they have an encounter with Jesus, that you are sacrificing your own time, your own energy, your own efforts, your own social relationships, your, the perception of your community about you, because this guy was unclean. So who is it that you're carrying to Jesus? Who do you carry today? Who is it that you want more than anything for them to be healed by Christ. Who are you carrying? We live, we live in a broken world. There are people who need some carrying, right? Many days, I'm one of them, right? But there are people who don't yet, haven't yet had an encounter with Jesus that can change their life, right? Once you've experienced the living water, you kind of have got a little bit of a sense how to get back to the well, right? But if you haven't experienced that yet, you need some people to carry you there. Who are you carrying? Who are you carrying to Jesus? I believe every one of us can carry someone. Absolutely. 
And I want to ask something very personal, and I'm not going to ask you to share answers. But I want to ask you, what is it that has broken you down so that you need carrying? Right? Ellen White gives us some insight into the paralyzed man, that it was his own reckless living that led to his situation. His own wasteful living, kind of the, the prodigal son idea, right? Wasteful living. That it was that kind of living that led him to where he was. What is it that's breaking you down? That means that one day you need a mat, right? What is hiding the beauty of God from your soul. All of us wrestle with something. We have something that prevents us from approaching the throne of grace freely and boldly at times. Maybe it's our own righteousness. Maybe it's our own shame. Maybe it's guilt. What is it that stops you from approaching Jesus? What is paralyzing you? Jesus offers complete healing. Complete healing. The amazing thing is, is when we carry each other, when we allow ourselves to be carried, we wind up at the feet of Jesus. And at the feet of Jesus comes complete healing, overpowering, amazing grace. And when people see what he does in our lives, they will say, wow, we never saw anything like this. We never saw anything like this. I hope that we as Christian women realize that we can be nice, and nice is important, right? Nice is really important because nice matters. It's this, there's this big sign in the town where my parents live uh, at one of the little shops there, and that's all it says, because nice matters. Nice matters, right? But Jesus isn't asking us to just be nice. Nice, is, nice matters, absolutely. But he's not asking us to be nice. He's asking us to have compassion, which means that we don't leave people in the situations they're in. It means that we carry them to Jesus so he can fix the situation to his glory and to our benefit, right? He does all of those things for us. We never saw anything like this. There's a story from the Olympics. I love the Olympics. Do you guys watch the Olympics? Yeah, right? I turn into a little bit of a nerd. So wherever I am in the world, I I find the Olympics if I can. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'll be up, right? And I'm... It's very strange watching the Olympics in America because we show all of the American athletes. And we, like, there's no other countries. It's very strange. <laughs> very strange. Uh, so I've been able to watch the Olympics from other countries, and they, you know, they might have like three Olympians. And so, you know, their perspective is a little bit different. So they focus on their guys, yeah, absolutely, which races they're in and that sort of stuff. But they also show all of these amazing stories from around the world. And maybe you will remember this one from 1992. The Barcelona Olympics, Summer Olympics, was a track meet. And Derek Redmond was running. He was a British runner. And it was the 400-meter race. And at about 250 meters in, and he was flying. The man, he was like the Usain Bolt of the 1992 Olympics, right? He was like the wind, super fast. And he was racing along. And all of a sudden, you can go back and see the videos. He pulls up and jumps and grabs his leg and starts bouncing down and he curls up on the sidewalk on the track, right? He curls up there like this, holding his leg and he just stops and the stretcher comes out for him and he waves it off and he stands up and he starts hobbling and he can't, he can't, he doesn't have full range of motion and he plainly is in pain and he's hobbling along and all of a sudden you see, you see two guys in the background and one is shoving the other one away And you're like, what is going on? There's like a wrestling match at the Olympics, right? And you see this other guy shove a security guard away, and he comes rushing up, and he grabs Derek. He throws Derek's arm around his shoulder, and it's his dad. 
and he's standing right there, and they finish the race together. They hobble the whole way, right? Derek never went back to the Olympics, but he finished his race, and he finished it in the arms of his father. Ladies, the same is true for us. We might be hobbling, but there's a father who will carry us to the very end, and he will bring us everything we need. Can we pray together? Yeah. Gracious God, thank you for being the one who will carry us to the end, for surrounding us with beautiful and amazing saints, those who are your followers. And we pray, Lord, that we will continue from here lifted and whole, complete in Jesus Christ. Lord, for those of us who need healing, we ask for it. For those of us who need peace, we ask for it. For those who need wisdom and courage, the ability to see through the darkness, we ask for it. Lord, may we carry each other, and may we allow ourselves to be carried when we cannot do it ourselves. We are so grateful for your grace, your mercy, and your peace in our lives. May they continue this day until forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.